Welcome to Word Pictures, a program of discussion and discovery. We examine the stories, events, and persons as described in the Word Pictures, presented in the 66 books of Scripture we know as the Word of God. But what kind of God is pictured here? By reading these stories, some become fearful, others adore. Yet others are just confused. Come, let us see for ourselves in an unrehearsed, no question barred discussion with people just like you as we search for the God of these stories. What picture of God will emerge for you? Let's join the discussion right now. Welcome to our discussion and thank you for joining us. We're doing a relatively quick trip through the Bible. By quick I mean probably about 50 sessions through the Bible. And now we're in the New Testament in the book of First and Second Thessalonians. Please get your Bibles and join us. Um, these are perhaps the first books written that compose our New Testament. And if you'd open your Bible to First Thessalonians 4, verse 13, I'll read, we'll read together. Our friends, we want you to know the truth about those who have died so that you will not be sad, as are those who have no hope. We believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will take back with Jesus those who have died believing in him. What we are teaching you now is the Lord's teaching. We who are alive on the day the Lord comes will not go ahead of those who have died. There will be the shout of command, the archangel's voice, the sound of God's trumpet, and the Lord himself will come down from heaven. Those who have died believing in Christ will rise to life first. Then we who are living at that time will be gathered up along with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. So then, encourage one another with these words. Ken, this is uh, perhaps the most famous text from Thessalonians, and uh, it's a bit controversial in some respects. Mm -hmm. um, like the King James says, uh, the Lord, uh, those will not be prevented mm -hmm. from going to mm -hmm. heaven, and so on. The, the, the living will not prevent the the, no. the living it? righteous will not prevent the living dead from rising from their graves. No. Yes. Is someone grabbing a hold of someone's um, leg and or, or, or trying to stomp on their gravestone to make sure they don't come out? <laughs> no, it doesn't. That's just a trivia question, but let's just deal with that first. Um, the King James was using a different kind of English than we use today. Uh, these and thou's were actually the familiar form of of, of the language in those days. That was a common way you address people. You and, and me and, and th those kind of words were, were the more formal. So it's just the opposite of what it is now. We think the thee and the thou's are the very formal. Uh, and we're, in those days, prevent, you can recognize that vent um, is talking about something that goes or comes. It's like this, the Latin uh, is talking about travel. Prevent would mean those who go ahead of somebody else. Well, now, unfortunately, well, fortunately, unfortunately, as the case may be, in our time, prevent has come to have a completely different meaning. So it's not appropriate to talk about preventing um, <coughs> the righteous, the righteous dead. But rather preceding. Preceding is the right word now. Yes. Well, as we turn to First and Second Thessalonians, we're looking at the first books that Paul wrote. Uh, probably written somewhere around uh, 50, 51, possibly early into 52 AD. Um, There's some technical ways in which we determine how these things are dated. Um, there are some um, ro actually Roman um, calendars that identify certain people who served in certain offices and some of them are named where they were at a certain time. And so we can nail these dates down pretty precisely. So um, we're talking about a time around about 50 AD when these two books were written. Now you remember, just briefly, that uh, Paul was on his, 
actually his second missionary journey. He has traveled over into Europe for the first time, and he went to Philippi. There was problems there. He went on to Thessalonica, and he could only stay there for three weeks because the Jews who opposed him in, in Philippi rushed to Thessalonica and tried to stop him from preaching there. He had to go on to Berea, and then there was problems there, and he had to go on to Athens. And so Paul is writing back to this church that he's been with only a very short period of time to try to strengthen them and straighten them out on certain issues. And we'll talk about the details about how that happened. But I thought in just a couple of minutes here we would um, run through the chronology. Very few people have <coughs> stopped to think this through. The chronology of what happened from the time Christ died up to the, to the books of the New Testament. Christ died in the spring of A.D. 31. Stephen was stoned in A.D. 34. And you remember Acts 8.1, it just says, immediately there was a terrible persecution of Christians, and the Christians scattered. They took with them the good news of the gospel. Uh, uh, probably about a... Now by scattered, do you mean <clears throat> they left Jerusalem and went out to Nazareth, or they went to China, or... They, when, I, when say, we say scattered, <coughs> they, went, they left Jerusalem. Many of them went over into Perea on the other side of the Jordan River. Others went into Samaria, but they also scattered into Egypt and, and Cyprus and Antioch and places like that, around the Mediterranean world. And this persecution was in Jerusalem, or was it throughout the Roman Empire? Primarily in Jerusalem and in Judea, yeah. And by the way, we should mention that this proposed chronology, as well as the whole teacher's guide, is in the uh, website. Yes. Theox.org, that's T H E O X dot O R G, you will find the handout uh, that we're generally following in about First and, Thess First and Second Thessalonians, and it will have there uh, this uh, chronology. Did you say then, that um, Stephen died about four years after Christ? Three and a half years. Three and a half years, okay. You remember that Daniel prophesied that there would be a lot of major events happening in the last year of that. 490-year uh, prophecy, the 70-week prophecy. So at the beginning of that seven years, Christ was anointed. He began his ministry, his baptism. In the middle of that seven years, Christ was crucified. At the end of that seven years, Stephen was stoned. And, and according to the predictions from Daniel, uh, the, the, the God stopped focusing on the Jews as his primary messengers to the world of the gospel. And he said, now I'm going to start working with the Christian church that doesn't leave out the Jews, it just includes everybody else as well. And so the gospel is now spreading everywhere, Jews, Gentiles, and so forth. It's going to be a while before the Jews sort of figure out, even the Christian Jews figure out that God is also reaching out to Gentiles, but we'll get to that in a moment, okay? So in 35, almost certainly in AD 35, Paul had that Damascus Road experience and he became a Christian. From 35 to 38, he was off in the deserts of Arabia and in Dam Damascus, polishing up his thinking, changing his thinking, doing the fruit basket upset from his Phariseeism to become a true follower of Jesus. Then um, in 38, he escaped from, with his life from Damascus. He went to Jerusalem. He was, his life was threatened there, so he escaped from Jerusalem and went back to his hometown in Tarsus. And we don't hear anything more about him for a number of years. In 44 AD, James, apostle of John, was martyred. And Peter was imprisoned, and Herod Agrippa died an awful death. All those things happened in that year, and uh, you remember that Peter was, was put in that prison with 16 people guarding him, and even though none of them moved, and he knew anything was happening, Peter was miraculously uh, escaped and went and, and told the Christians that he had escaped and they sent him out. So that was AD 44. And AD 44, 45, Barnabas took Paul, well, the Christians who went to Antioch for the first time began preaching the gospel directly to Gentiles. Prior to that, they had, nobody had really uh, preached to Gentiles. Now there was the Cornelius story, but remember that Cornelius had already been more or less a convert to Judaism even though he was a Roman, before he became a Christian. And so now for the first time, 44, 45 in there, the people of Antioch began to 
said, no, we're not going to preach the gospel just to Jews. We're going to preach it to anybody who listens in Greek. So the gospel, and when the, the church just started exploding, and the people in Jerusalem heard about it, Barnabas went up there, and he saw what was happening. He started leading out in the work there, and he almost immediately recognized he needed more help, and he remembered about Paul. And he traveled across the corner of the Mediterranean there to Tarsus and said, Paul, we need you over in Ant uh, Antioch. And Paul, Paul went ba back with him and began his, his ministry, basically. Then um, in 45, AD 45, Paul and Barnabas, there had been some questions about different things, and so they took famine relief down to Jerusalem. In 45 to 47, Paul did his first missionary journey. That's, you can read about that in Acts uh, 14, 15 in there. In 49, well, Paul came back to Antioch, was working in Antioch for a period of time, and then the news started to get out among the Jewish Christians that Paul was really bringing a lot of Gentiles into the church. And there was a terrible fear that um, the church was going to stop being a Jewish sect. It was going to, the Christian church was going to be an independent church, and the Jewish Christians were not happy, some of them anyway, especially the former Pharisees, were not happy about that at all, and they wanted to stop it. And so they, they tried to raise a ruckus. They're, they tried to stop things in Antioch. So Paul and his friends said, okay, we're going to take a delegation from here. We're going to go to Jerusalem. And they had that famous conference that you can read about in Acts 15. And they were told, okay, Gentiles, it's, you're free to, to convert Gentiles. They can join the church. But there's four things that we want them to be sure they do. No food offered to idols, nothing strangled, no blood, and avoid sexual immorality. Now, that's not a new version of the gospel. <laughs> that's a way of saying, Okay, if you want to worship in church with us who have been former Jews, uh, you better do these things because we, we just can't even sit next to you if you're doing those things. Basically, that was, that was the issue. Well, then in 50 and 51, Paul went on his second missionary journey, traveled up through the same churches that he had started previously, and then on up to Troas. And, and there he apparently was sick. He met Dr. Luke. Dr. Luke became a convert. And then he, Paul received that, that vision, said, come over to Macedonia to help us. And Paul and his group, for the first time, entered Europe. And that's about where we pick up this part of the story. We'll come back to it in a moment. Um, in AD 52, they returned back home to Antioch. 53 to 58, Paul went on his, on his um, third missionary journey. Um, which, during which most of that time he spent in the, in the city of Ephesus. He did some traveling around. Um, finally, in 58, uh, Paul traveled back to Jerusalem from Corinth, went in and tried to go through that very conservative, very Jewish ceremony of, of uh, shaving his head and making offerings and so forth. And he was seen in the temple by some Jews from, Mas from, from Europe that thought that he was he had taken some Gentiles into the temple and made a big ruckus, and Paul was arrested. And basically, starting in AD 58, Paul had almost no free time left for the rest of his life. For the next 10 years, almost that entire time, he was in prison. Um, he spent the first couple of years in prison in Caesarea Maritima, uh, which was the Roman governor's place. Uh, for, for Judea in those days. Then in, that, uh, in the fall of that year, uh, he was asked, well, what do you want to do? You want to go back to Jerusalem, be tried in Jerusalem? He said, no, I appeal to Caesar. He was put on a boat, and they had that shipwreck. They ended up in Malta and spent the winter there and then caught another ship in the spring and traveled on to Rome. From 61 to 63, Paul was in prison in Rome. Um, during those years, well, near the end of those years, he wrote the books. I'm sorry, back up a little bit. Before, just before he went to Jerusalem, Paul wrote uh, First and Second. Uh, I'm sorry, Paul wrote Galatians and Romans. He had written First and Second Thessalonians while he was in Ephesus. Then, at the end of his imprisonment, or near the end of his imprisonment in Rome, he wrote Ephesians, Colossians, Philemon, Philippians, and probably wrote Hebrews. Um, then from 63 to 66 was his period of, short period of time, a couple of years of, of freedom um, after his imprisonment. And then he was re-imprisoned 
on 8066, and by 67 probably, or maybe 68, he was beheaded. As a Roman citizen, he was, they, they were not allowed to crucify him. He, was, he was, had his head cut off. And Peter died the same year, probably. And a couple years later, the destruction of Jerusalem take, took place in AD 70. And then about 20 years after that, uh, John wrote his three small books, the Gospel and the Book of Revelation. And thus we have uh, our New Testament as we have it today. That was a very quick rundown, but just gives you a, a little feel for where we are. So go back to AD 50, 51, somewhere in there, and Paul has traveled from Antioch over to Cyprus, did some preaching. He and Barnabas together did some preaching around there, even spoke to the governor of, of Cyprus and so forth, then traveled across to uh, the mainland, what we would call Turkey today, and started up to the central part of Turkey and preached and started up churches in what, we, what, would, what was in those days called a Southern Galatia. And what we refer to as the books of First and Second Thessalonians and Colossians and Galatians, really they were letters that Paul wrote. These were letters. These were all letters that Paul wrote. <coughs> That's correct. To, to friends, to churches where he'd started work, and so forth. Yeah, they weren't intentionally written as some kind of theological treatise for, uh, you know, for people to, uh, to read. They're written as letters. Yeah, uh, and Paul, another thing we should mention is that probably every one of his letters was actually written by a secretary, they did the actual writing. Paul probably dictated, and a secretary, in those days they were called an amanuensis, the amanuensis would actually do the writing of the, of the books. And so you will find at the end of Second Thessalonians, we'll see that Paul says, see with, what's see with what large letters I write, this is how I sign my letters. If, if you did not sign like this, it probably didn't come from me. Something to that effect. Okay? So what do we find in uh, the book of Thessalonians that uh, we should really focus on? Um, let me just read briefly the introduction to Thessalonians found in the Message Bible. It will give us a sort of a feel for the overall uh, picture. The way we conceive the future sculpts the present gives contour and tone to nearly every action and thought through the day. If our sense of future is weak, we live listlessly. Much emotional and mental illness and most suicides occur among men and women who feel that they, quote, have no future, end quote. The Christian faith has always been characterized by a strong and focused sense of future, with belief in the second coming of Jesus as the most distinctive detail. From the day Jesus ascended into heaven, his followers lived in expectancy of his return. He told them he was coming back. They believed he was coming back. They continue to believe it. For Christians, it is the most important thing to know and believe about the future. The practical effect of this belief is to charge each moment of the present with hope. For if the future is dominated by the coming again of Jesus, there is little clutter I'm sorry, a little room left on the screen for projecting our anxieties and fantasies. It takes the clutter out of our lives. We're far more free to respond spontaneously to the freedom of God. At the same time, or at all the same, the belief can be misconceived so that it results in paralyzing fear for some, shiftless indolence for, uh, in others. Paul's two letters to the Christians in Thessalonica, among much else, correct such debilitating misconceptions, prodding us to continue to live forward and taught in joyful expectancy for what God will do next in Jesus. So Paul has, w was very concerned that somehow in that very short time he had spent with the Corinthians, I'm sorry, with the Thessalonians, that they might not have gotten the entire gospel completely straight. So as soon as Timothy arrived, he said, what's going on? Tell me about what's going on in Thessalonica. Are they okay? And he sent Timothy back to say, what's going on? Find out what's going on over there. And Thessalonica was a church that Paul had started? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. A church, Thessalonica is a, a, was a major city. It was um, a Roman colony. It was located on the Ignatian Road, which is the major road east from Rome to all parts east. 
It was located right there, and it was located just in the dip of the mountain so that you almost had to go through Thess unless you're going to go by boat, you almost had to go through Thessalonica to go on east. So it was a ma and it located on the Thermaic or, or the Salonica uh, Gulf. So it was, it was a really, you could either go on through uh, the, the pass there or you could turn and, and get on a ship and go east that way. So it was a major commercial center. So this, he had been there before, yes. raised up this little Christian church, and this is at least one. Well, we have two letters here. Who knows how many he sent? But these are letters he used to correspond. Yes, with the, these people with those, with those people. So, <coughs> Paul talks about God's wrath. He talks about various things in the beginning. Um, well, I was going to ask about that introduction. Mm -hmm. Do you think that a big chunk of the happiness in the Christian church is expectations about what's coming in the future? Well, let me answer that by looking back at the early church. Peter cussed and swore that he didn't know Jesus because a, a maid pointed her finger at him and said, you sound like you come from Galilee. A few weeks later, after he was sure that Jesus was alive and he was sure that Jesus was coming back and that Jesus was with him, would be with him until that point of time, he had no fear of death anymore. He stood up more than once in front of the Sanhedrin. You can read about this in, in Acts 4 and 5. He stood up in front of the Sanhedrin and he said, You crucified the Son of God. You crucified the Messiah. And I will not, under any circumstances, stop preaching in his name. Did it make a difference to Peter? So, um, he, has, he has expectations about life further than what everybody else does. Yep. Um, so I guess the answer is yes. Yes. Uh, assuming that Christianity is really meaningful for us. Well, when Jesus left, he said he's coming back. Yeah. And this is a promise that, that um, uh, <clears throat> the more literal you believe that, the more fervent you seem to, to look forward to the future. There in time there are those who seem to think this is not such a literal thing but well, but it is it is a hope of uh, these coming back a hope that your lives can change so yeah I would say it is hope you know a person who had no biblical background whatsoever and you sat him down and you said you know sometime in the near future the the the, the, the world is going to come crashing down basically and then suddenly the whole heaven is going to be full of brilliant angels announcing the coming of Jesus and he's going to take the righteous from here and he's going to take them off through space somewhere and, and they're going to stay there for a thousand years and the wicked are all going, the wicked who aren't dead already are all going to die and then a thousand years later he's going to bring them back and, and God himself is going to come and live on this earth and, and there's going to be a third coming and you know the wicked are all going to be perished ultimately and then God is going to remake this whole earth uh, like the Garden of Eden and they're going to say what side of the bed did you get out of? You know they're going to, they're going to, you know, they're going to think what kind of craziness is this? It's, I mean nothing in this, nothing in the history of our world even close to that has ever happened. And it sounds really bizarre, really way out. But if you go back and you understand the biblical history and you see that everything that God has predicted some very apparently bizarre things have all happened exactly as God predicted them. Yes. So well, what do you do then? What, what about nowadays, though? Do you think that everybody, that people are really excited about the Lord coming? It seems like in our church, it's more important the Sabbath issue is the most important thing, or the health issue is the most important thing. Um, that's what they talk about the most. So well, we are called Seventh Day, but we're more important than that called Adventists. Well, that's true. If we're really Adventists, then our focus ought to be on the Second Coming. But it, it seems like there's so much apathy as far as the, the uh, Second well, Coming goes. Did, are you there's surprised? Heresy here. <laughs> you, you should, well, I'm you just telling just, it like it is. Just an observation, you're saying. Well, <laughs> yeah, I mean, but, I'm just telling you like it is. I, I see more excitement coming up about health issues or or Sabbath versus Sunday than 
then um, then the Lord actually coming and taking us home. Have you have you forgotten what it said about the ten virgins? Matthew twenty five. What are they? What were they all doing? They were all sleeping. sleeping. They were all sleeping. Well, let's hope the sleeping doesn't last too much longer. So this has been foretold. Mm -hmm. What I've just spoke about has been foretold. Yes. So the other thing is, Peter got his priorities straight. Mm -hmm. We haven't really had to go through too much of anything to sharpen us up. Yeah, I mean, you wonder what would happen to our church. I mean, well, I belong to University Church here, and there are six thousand, six between six and seven thousand members. What would happen if suddenly, in the middle of the week, government showed up and said anybody who comes to church here on Sabbath is going to be under under trial for their lives? How many people do you think would show up? One. <laughs> <laughs> And that does ha happen today in other countries. It does. Definitely. Well, what, what happened to Peter in between the maid pointing the finger at him and him denying Jesus and his uh, appearance before the Sanhedrin was the Holy Spirit came. Well, they studied and the Holy Spirit came on them and then they had great well, conviction. Okay. But and there's, truth. There, there's something else really important that happened there that we, we mustn't forget but most people don't even think about. And that's this. When Jesus rose from the grave on Sunday and they discovered that actually he was risen and they saw him and they felt him and they touched him and then they said, guess what? This person that we have spent three and a half years with is in fact God himself. All of a sudden, their whole collection of ideas about even everything that Jesus had taught them just I mean, it was a fruit basket upset. You know, this is not a question about, you know, should we believe what the Pharisees teach or should we believe what the Sadducees teach? We now have been in the presence of God himself. And everything we believed before is out the window and we're going to rethink everything in light of the fact that this Jesus was God. And when they did that, it made all the difference in the world. So what experience do you think we are going to go through in the last days that will get us back to that level? Uh, since we didn't really live with Jesus and go through his, with him personally through an experience and then have all this stuff happen. I we are here and, yeah. you know, we got to... We're going to see people coming, claiming to be Christ. We're going to see the devil doing more and more vigorous things. We're going to see more and more terrible things happening in the world, things falling apart, maybe global warming, who knows what, all kinds of disasters. I mean, we see more and more disasters happening. And um, I think all these things, eventually people are going to start waking up and they're going to have to make a decision. You know, I can see fear coming from that. Yes. But, but having that conversion, that, 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 idea that came to Peter when he put everything together I don't see I don't see that coming together by seeing those things do you I mean just these scary things happening and well when when we read the scripture we know what Ken said to be true that many false witnesses will come and certainly we've seen them many many scores of people saying they're the Christ. So. But nothing like what's coming. It's right. going to be a lot more of them. So we're kind of encouraged by the fact that we can see these We can see those things, you know, the, the buildup. Right. We're starting to see the buildup. Well, it's about time for us to take a break. I would like you to turn to your Bibles and read 2 Thessalonians 2.18. We'll talk about it when we come back.
Welcome back, and let me correct myself. First of all, I'm glad you're looking in your Bible. It's actually 1 Thessalonians 2.18 I want you to look at. And it says, we wanted, this is Paul talking, of course, we wanted to return to you. I myself, remember, he only was able to spend three weeks with them. I wanted to return to you. I myself tried to go back more than once, but Satan would not let us. Okay, folks. What is What's that? going on here? <laughs> There's a passage in, in, in Daniel that's a little like that. Yes. Am I, am I thinking correctly? Yes, toward the end Daniel there? 9. That's right. There was, Michael was calling to come, and, mm -hmm. and there was a, some evil angels there preventing the way. So, so what's so fantastic about that? <clears throat> I mean, do you, how many of things you plan to do are prevented by the devil? Well, sometimes I, when I read that, I just wonder if, if he just read, didn't write down all the things that happen, you know. So you're saying that this was some bunch of other events and he thought maybe the devil was behind it? Well, it could be, but, um, you know, he could have took some time to, okay, let me outline what I meant by this, yeah. you know, and then he spends half his book writing down you know, what was happening that it made him conclude that the devil was doing it, but uh, he didn't do it. He just shortly said, well, the devil prevented it. Okay, me. but why would Paul say this? Why, why would Paul say this? What do you think? Once Paul had the uh, vision on the road and realigned his outlook on life, you might say, uh, he was a brilliant man. I'm going to read his stuff, you know, he was a brilliant man. It doesn't take long to figure. Whichever way he went, very soon, sometimes longer, he got trouble. Mm -hmm. And it was happening too frequently to not be thwarting from the devil the way I see it. Well, I mean, considering what's going on in the world at that point in time, if you were the devil, where would you be working? Right where he, where Paul was. <laughs> right where Paul was, exactly. So. But it, I think it's very important for us to recognize the devil in our day seems to be sort of working almost undercover. You know, we don't see big events that look like they're directly connected to, to de the workings of the devil. In some countries, even so, we still see it today. But not in the United States, for example. We don't see obvious things where the devil's working. But the devil was working very openly here. He was doing whatever he could to stop. I mean, Jesus was dead. Jesus was gone. Not, I mean, he wasn't dead anymore, but he died and he was raised and gone back to heaven. So Satan couldn't yet get after him. The most dangerous person alive on planet Earth at this point in time is Paul. And the devil's there. And Paul knows the devil is there. And that should teach us a very important lesson. We may not immediately recognize him, but where is the great controversy taking place every day? right between our ears. And we need to recognize that the devil is alive and well on planet Earth. What specific form do you think this uh, Satan interfering would not let us go back? What, what form do you think that took? Was that storms? Was that uh, illness? What do you think? Um, I mean, that's a good question. And Paul doesn't bother to comment on it. It could have been anyone else. It could have been just people telling him, if you go back to Thessalonica, they'll kill you. Trouble from the authorities, yeah. other yeah. things mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Re regarding the resurrection, for the most part, they believe that uh, they would, only when the kingdom came, they would you know, meet with Jesus and what have you. But Paul keeps saying, we do not mourn like those who have no hope. Exactly what does he mean by that? Well, we're going to get to that in a moment. Okay, because with Jesus, when they asked Jesus, when I, the guy who talked about <laughs> the man who married the sisters, mm -hmm. and he asked which one of the sisters would be yeah. his wife. Yeah. And Jesus said, it's not going to be like that. It's going to be like angels. Mm -hmm. So what exactly does that mean? What is our expectation in the hereafter mm -hmm. regarding people that we know that have died? Yeah, that's, that's the question. Well, what we see as we look at 1 Thessalonians, we're still there, don't go to 2 Thessalonians yet. We're still at 1 Thessalonians. The first three chapters is basically historical material about how Paul, what Paul did, the, the messages he got, what he heard about the Thessalonians, etc. 
But he comes to chapter 4 and 5, and he says, okay, now I need to talk to you about some issues that are really important. He, and he, and he, he reminds them that, that they live in a hostile environment. There's sexual immorality, there's all kinds of problems. You can read about that in First Thessalonians 4, the first eight verses. And then he says, you know, but we Christians should be known for the fact that we love each other. That's what Christianity is supposed to be all about. And it, we should go about our lives quietly, doing our business, and representing Jesus Christ. And then he comes to those famous verses that we read at the beginning, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18. And these have been a challenge um, for various reasons. Because with, to, 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 to look at it just briefly, um, the main emphasis of this passage is, is three things. Those who have died in Christ are not lost, they will rise again. That's, that's probably the most important message. Two, those who are still alive at the time of Christ's coming will ascend with the formerly dead to meet Christ in the air. That's verse 17. And we will live together forever with them and the Lord. That's verse 18. That's the sort of sum of it. But the question is, there's, there's very different approaches to these verses based on what you think happens to a person when he dies. Our Christian friends who believe that when a person dies, his soul or his spirit departs and goes to heaven, what's going to happen? Is, is, is that soul or spirit going to have to come back? Well, it's been up there enjoying the music without any ears, enjoying the food without any stomach, enjoying the, you know, talking about what happened here on this earth and thinking about what's going on without any brain. Uh, you know, what are those people, what, what are those souls or spirits, if there are any, what are they doing up there? I don't think there's any such thing. I think it's God gives us life. When we've had our run in this world, he takes it. Okay. Whatever life is. Mm -hmm. that's so that's the, the other approach. Yeah. So Seventh-day Adventists are among those, a relatively minor, a relative minority of Christians who believe in the sleep death. That's supported by many verses in Scripture, uh, probably the most famous of which is in, in John 11, where Jesus just says plainly to his disciples, Lazarus is asleep, and they say, oh, that's fine, he'll get well. And Jesus said, no, Lazarus is dead. And he went and raised him back to life. And Lazarus didn't bother, didn't, didn't, wasn't rushing around telling everybody about what it was like to be dead and all the things he did while he was dead. No, there was no word about that. He was sleeping. He was dead in his grave. So if you take that approach, then at the second coming, what happens? Oh, we tell we're going to be given a new body. We're reinvigorated somehow. We, not, we don't know what happens, really. We just know it's told that it will. First Corinthians, we'll look at it later. First Corinthians 15 tells us we'll have new bodies, uh, and, but the person will be the same. And that the dead in Christ will rise first, then those who are alive will be caught up together with them to do what? To go to heaven. That's what it seems to say. But you said person. What you, what you mean by that is the personality and the character are mm -hmm. the same. The way I have explained that in the past, I think it's much easier to explain in our day of computers. Um, if you have been, I've had a computer almost since the beginning of personal computers, way back in the early 80s. Um, I got my first <coughs> relatively complicated computer, it was an IBM. And that thing, you know, you'd put the, you put your disk in there and go, <laughs> and finally, finally it would come up with, with something on the green screen, you know, and so forth. But if you, if you were saving something in a Word, in a Word document or a Word Perfect document or something like that, you could have taken that material out, and even today you could put it in one of the latest machines, and that machine would still read it. And it would, the same program would, I mean, obviously a much updated version and a much updated computer. So now you, you, you just touch a button and it reads from the hard disk and instantly your document's up there and bang like that. It's, it's a much better, much improved situation. But the basic material, the, 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 the stuff that's recorded there is still the same. So God is going to take me, which is really 
you know, the patterns of things that are recorded in my brain, and he's going to take that software, and he's going to put it in a new piece of hardware, and it's going to work a lot better. Is, is Paul really, does he really mean graves? And the reason I ask this is, uh, for example, there's lots of people who have perished and never had a grave. Yeah. And then, but if you do have a grave, unless you're embalmed, mm -hmm. you know, uh, even if they put you in a, a, a wood box or something, when you, when you, when, when it <laughs> you turn to dirt. Right. And if you plant corn on the top, you know, it fertilizes. So, I mean, it's kind of a funny thing to think about it, but yeah. that's, you know, that's really kind of how it is. So, what, what, yeah. what, how important is the, is the, is the, the grave itself for, I mean, I mean think I, of what, you know, the, the question, when someone poses that question to me, I ask them, what do you think has happened to the molecules that were part of Adam's body? Those things have been recycled so many times. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, I have to chuckle when you ask the question about turning back to dirt. You heard about the little boy that went to his mommy and says, is it really true that the Bible says we're made out of dirt and we go back to dirt? And he goes, yes, that's exactly what the Bible says. The little boy says, Oh, I mean, there must be a lot of people coming and going under my bed. <laughs> <laughs> Let me ask you a question. Uh, we just talked about the state of the dead here a little bit. Why is that important that we get it right? Because I, it seems to me like most of the people could be resurrected, and then they'll see how it really is, and they just go, oh, let's go, mm -hmm. you know, and that's it. So. Yeah. You know, I see a lot of people fighting over this, this or, stuff. Okay, here's or if, I, if I believe that, you know, well, I'm, I'm going to go to heaven. What does that hurt? Okay, Here, here's, here's but, the issue. But there, there's another thing, though. You know, I, the one thing I know of is that people may go to a seance or something, you know, and start believing that, that things are happening and they get sucked into some of the, one of the devil's traps. Mm -hmm. But I don't know if they go there by knowledge. I think they go there because it's an emotional thing. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't think that knowing it correctly is going to stop those people from going to a seance anyway. It Especially it some. It okay, I know, but but here's the issue. Let's be very clear. Back in the beginning, God said, "People who sin are going to die." The Satan said they won't. If you believe that people never die, if you believe in the you know, everlasting, the eternal nature of a soul, for example, or a spirit, something like that, never die, you are on the Satan, you're on Satan's side. You are, you've taken his line at least at that point in time and you're believing what he said. Now, Jesus died to prove that when people sin, they, they, they die. That was one of the main things he proved by his death. If you accept this other point of view, you're basically saying, well, you know, <clears throat> I'm not so sure that's that, that important. And you need a hell. Yeah. Because if God is going to reward the good guys, yeah. what's he going to do to the bad guys? I don't know if you need that. That's yes, just an explanation. Well, well okay. type of thing. To me, it's then they're self-existent. Easy in. Yeah, it does. If you don't believe it this correctly, well, well then it boils down to just, okay, you really die, or you don't really die, mm -hmm. okay? But that's pretty, well, pretty okay, separate than, than all these theories about, you know, when, you, when your resurrection happens or, or um, a secret go. rapture or all that stuff, you let's know? Let's go to the next step, okay? What happens if you really believe that we don't die? As Jim has just mentioned, What's going to happen to the people who aren't righteous? They're going to go to hell, right? That's the teaching. What does it say to you about God to believe that he runs a hell? Or even that he allows a hell? Schizophrenic. And you end up with all kinds of terrible pictures of God. And these ideas permeated the thinking in, in, the, in the Dark Ages. That's part of why they were called Dark Ages. Uh, because and people did everything they could possibly do to try to get out and get away from the influence of the whole uh, of the, the Christian church 
their teaching about hell because they didn't want to believe that God, and, and even today, many people raise the question, what kind of a God, I mean, how could you even worship a God who would do that to anybody? You, you how, mean, can you, how can a God who claims to be love allow that to happen to somebody? So, You're so referring you, to a, a hell where people are still alive within that and hell. And burning. Because burning, certainly burning. the a lot of people seem to be confused about the translation of what does hell mean, the actual words the of words, hell. The word hell translated, is translated from a Hebrew and a Greek word that literally mean the grave. Yes. There's no eternally burning fire in the Bible. So now, you, some you people think if they get that wrong, they're going to automatically go to those ideas no matter what. Well, that's There's what's no happened to almost all Christians. The churches play on the fears then, and then they get them to buy indulgences. No, no, no I'm not talking about is. what the church has done. I'm talking well, about their understanding real. of the death, of death and life and death. I don't know if they really understand it. They've just peddled uh, a deception and, and extort money out of them in order to avoid those. Well, recognition. I know they've done that, but that's still outside my question. Well, you, you know, what the question is if if. If it should be clear to an individual, which is what you're sort of implying, that people shouldn't be mis misled by this, then are you saying that all Christians who believe this are not awake? They're not thinking? Well, Why do so many people believe these notions? What I'm saying, there's going to be a lot of people that are going to rise, raise up from the dead and probably find out the truth right at that point. Yes. So. Yeah. I'm just not saying, I'm just saying that maybe just because they got it wrong doesn't really mean that they're going to, they're going to lose, yeah, you right. know, eternal no, we're life. Not, we're, yeah. we're not, we're not saying that someone who may have been deceived is eternally lost. Right. We're not my, saying that. My, about the death. Maybe yeah, all of you death. have heard this story before. My old pastor used to tell a story, and everybody knows this one, about the king was hiring a new chariot driver mm -hmm. and he hired many how close can you get to the edge and they all came and saw how close they could get to the edge finally one guy got as close as he could to the side of the mountain and he said king when you're in my chariot I'm gonna stay as close to the mountain as possible in other words you know in, we need to try to stay away from any lack of faith or lack of knowledge or or deception, just stay away from it as far as possible. We're not saying that those folks are going to be unsaved because we've got a saving God and that's up, up to Him. But people can get confused. If everyone starts believing a certain way, whatever the point is, people will get further and further and further away from the truth. So it's better to try to stay as close as to what we know, what the Bible says, so that, you know, multitudes are not deceived. It gets easier and easier to deceive people the less and less they know and the less closely they follow. I think there will be a few people in heaven, some of the primitive societies that will probably make it to heaven won't even know what we're talking about. Right. Yeah. But right. for me, if you don't want to buy the devil's wares, you don't go into his shop. And the state of the dead is one of those products he deals with very well. Yes. Yeah, but um, you're talking about a fearful thing, you know. He's going to impersonate Christ, and who knows what else is going to happen. He'll probably have some of his buddies doing it. And if you believe that Grandma is talking to you across the table, you got a problem if you see her. We know it's not Grandma. <coughs> yeah. Okay, now you're talking, you're talking about that one problem that I was talking about yeah, is well, the, that's, the that's other thing. But yeah. Well, we have a few minutes left to talk about the rest of Thessalonians, particularly 1 Thessalonians 5. Paul talks about a lot of things very briefly in 1 Thessalonians 5. He, 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 he goes on to talk about some of the issues we've just been talking about. He says, there's no need to, to, to write you, friends, about the times and occasions when these things will happen. For you yourselves know very well that the day of the Lord, that would be the second coming, will come as a thief comes at night. When people say everything is quiet and safe, then suddenly destruction will hit them. It will come as suddenly as the pains that come upon a woman in labor. People will not escape. But you, friends, are not in the darkness. See, you Christians, you people who understand the truth, you're not in the darkness, and the day should not take you by surprise like a thief. 
All of you are people who belong to the light, who belong to the day. We do not belong to the night or the darkness. So then we should not be sleeping like the others. We should be awake and sober. Paul says, don't get, don't get sucked up into these false ideas. The truth is spelled out in Scripture. Read it for yourself. Understand it for yourself. Let's have these points clear. Now, he goes on to say some inter interesting things. Um, verse 12, we beg you, our friends, to pay proper respect to those who work among you, who guide and instruct you in the Christian life. Treat them with the greatest respect. So, you know, someone who's willing to risk his life to try to lead out in the church in Thessalonica needs to be respected, right? Uh, be at peace among yourselves. We urge you, our friends, to warn the idle, encourage the timid, help the weak, be patient with everyone. See that no one pays back wrong for wrong, but at all times make it your aim to go to do good to one another and to all people. Be joyful always. Pray at all times. Is that possible? The King James says, rejoice evermore. Do you do that? Do you go down the street saying, hooray, hooray, hallelujah, hallelujah? <laughs> you get locked up. It's, <laughs> it's, hard, it's hard with all the other sad, complaining people I around. See. But why, why would he feel it necessary to tell the Thessalonians this? Or is this just kind of a, a final salutation sort of thing? Or is he saying, you know, the Thessalonians really need to know this? It's, and what about us? Do we really need to know this? Well, I'm not so sure a person can be joyful always. <laughs> well, you can you can tell somebody the be have a good attitude. Uh -huh. Have a good attitude. Yeah. Have a good attitude today. Uh, can you do that? The whole day, all the time. <laughs> I think Paul is dealing with an with an underlying principle here of trying to cultivate your mind on godly things so yes. that you end up like that. You don't have to go around making a fool of yourself. Yeah, exactly. Well, then look at the next one. Pray at all times. Do you all do that? Or are you disobeying the Bible? Is that like but, talking to you all the time? <laughs> I mean, if I followed you around and kept talking to you, would that drive you crazy? Probably. It, it would take all my time up, too. Yeah. So, so is that what he's saying? What is Paul saying here? I don't <laughs> think he's saying praying without ceasing. Keep praying, praying, like some people sit and uh, nonstop. I don't think that's what he means. I mean, he prays regardless of what, what is happening. If it's good, pray. Thank God for it. If it's not good, still pray and find something good in it. I don't think he's expecting people to just sit. Some people thought that. That's why they stopped working and doing things. They just wanted mm -hmm. to relax and pray and wait for God to, uh, to come back. And part of praying is praising thank you. the Lord Lordship. also. So we can praise the Lord. You know, thank you for this tree. Thank you. But no. well, go ahead. You know, I was just going to say, you know, we're also instructed somewhere else not to just babble on in our prayer, but there's no reason why we can't be joyful to the Lord. Well, here's, here's one of those issues. We're told in several places that Jesus prayed all night and came out refreshed in the morning. Now, obviously, he knew some secrets that I don't know. I wish I knew how to do that. See? But nevertheless, scholars have looked at this and they said, you know, and there are my, I have friends who believe that when you pray, you have to kneel down. Well, obviously, they wouldn't get anything done. All day long, kneeling, your, your knees get pretty sore after a while, <laughs> among other things. Okay. No, that's not what this means. What this means is you need two things. It means you need to be constantly aware of God's presence. And as one scholar said a while back, some 20, 30 years ago, said, this reverse is talking about Thinking toward God. Being aware of His presence at all times. Thinking toward God. So in everything you do, you're thinking, you know, is God with me in this? Is this what God wants me to do? And so forth like that. And that's what this verse, I so think, is So it's kind about. of creating a habit as well. A good habit of communication with the Lord and a joyful habit and all of the other things. A joyful habit, a thankful habit. And uh, it's kind of like smiling. You know, I don't smile a lot sometimes because I lived, I won't 
mention the country, they might be upset, mm -hmm. you know, hearing that they don't smile. They do smile, but it was a very serious country, so sometimes we don't smile a lot. Everyone worked very hard, but it's a habit. We need to get into the habit of smiling, mm -hmm. the habit of happiness, the habit of prayer. And that leads us into the next verse, which says, be thankful in all circumstances. Can you really be thankful in all circumstances? I mean, this seems to get more, more difficult all the time. Learn from our mistakes, learn from our hardships. Okay. Be happy, oh, I made that, now I can grow a little bit. Job seemed to make a do of it, didn't he? Oh, wow. I wonder about that. Incredible, really incredible. Well, then he says something very interesting in the next couple of verses. Do not restrain the Holy Spirit. Do not despise inspired messages. Put all things to the test. Keep what is good and avoid every kind of evil. How do we do that? Well, we're running out of time, so let me see if I can just summarize those verses. 1 John 4, 1 says basically the same thing. God is saying, I gave you a brain for a very good reason. Even if you think a message has come from God, you better think it through very carefully. God never expects us to believe anything without getting a, giving us adequate evidence and it's evidence that appeals to the reason. And that's found in Steps to Christ, page 105. Look it up if you have any questions about it. So God is saying, think clearly. That's the reason for our health message. It's not just so we can have an excuse for running a hospital. No, it's so that our minds can be as clear as possible as we think about God. Paul is writing to his Thessalonian friends. He's saying, keep yourself as healthy as possible. Be aware of everything that's going on around you. Think toward God at all times. Be thankful for the times when God steps in and, and, and makes himself evident to you. Uh, do your best to represent God correctly by loving, kind actions and everything you do. And if we do those kinds of things, what will people around us, what will happen to them? They will be attracted and people, they will join the church. And that's the reason really why we're doing what we're doing. We want other people to see us. Jesus himself said, if you have love toward one another, what will happen? The whole world will know that you're Christians, John 13, 34, and 35. So that's our challenge. Does the world look at us? Do they see us and they say, I wish I could be like that? Do they see love that really impresses them? Think about it. See you next week.